Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to episode 9 of the Garot Podcast. I am your host, Chingachgook, and I am once again in studio with my co-host, Mr. Howard Rourke. We are now arriving at a point in the season where previously discussed terms will become increasingly recurrent. For those of you who are just joining us and are new to the podcast, welcome. For those of you who are returning, welcome back. For those of you in the former category, it is absolutely imperative that you go back and preferably listen to the podcasts in sequence from the beginning. Please do understand that listening to today's program by itself will very likely result in confusion because we are now starting to synthesize previously defined terms together. In the previous episode, I described the process by which we explored the ideas of terms like the shaman as a drifting process. Today is going to be much the same. We do not have a large set of terms to define in this episode, as we have done in previous episodes. In fact, we really only have one main term. But the weight and the magnitude behind this term cannot be understated. Furthermore, this term has an intimate relationship with terms that we have defined in previous episodes, namely the term Persig Knife. In previous episodes, I have used Robert Persig's Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance as key and core starting material to unpack the ideas behind these terms, which then, of course, goes on to service our work in bringing concise, articulated definitions to these terms. Let us not forget the very purpose of what we are doing here, the building out of a toolkit in the format of freestanding claims. That being said, we, myself, my co-host, are confronting a gargantuan task in trying to synthesize understanding and knowledge from a mountain of information that you, the listener, do not necessarily have access to. That is the very crux of much of today's difficulty, and also the difficulties in previous episodes as well. So, this is exactly the reason why I just said today is going to be another drifting episode. Today is going to be a lot of passage reading as well. If you at home have not read Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance by Robert Persick, I highly recommend you place on your priority list, at a very high level, a thorough reading of this text, from beginning to end, cover to cover, the entire novel. The ideas contained within this text are at the core of what it is that we're trying to unpack. The toolkit we are trying to assemble, but like with many things, and like with much of my previous struggles in trying to communicate with individuals, people, people don't read. People say, what are you talking about? What does that mean? I haven't read that book. And so I haven't read the book, therefore I have no access to the ideas. So how can I communicate to you sitting at home the ideas contained within these terms that arose from the book? from a position when you yourself have not read it. I cannot make that assumption. Thankfully, both my co-host and I have read this book in its entirety, so I'm not completely alone in the task. But like in the previous episode, I need to take you all on a tour to appropriately and fully understand today's term. That's the best that I can manage. The term that we will be addressing today is Aristotle's grid. Now, the term Aristotle's grid arises from the previously defined term Persig knife. Now, Persig knife is a term that we addressed in episode four of this podcast. So 
If you have not listened to episode four yet, I strongly recommend that you go back and at a very minimum listen to that. But by way of summary, the definition of Persic Knife that came out of episode four goes, a method of decisive subdivision that provides more than one option of analysis. And I used Persig's text and reading samples to elaborate on this idea and what that process looks like. So before we jump directly into attempting to define the term Aristotle's grid, I think it is wise that we first take a slight step back and return to the term Persig knife as a starting point, as a launch platform into what the results of that are. What happens when you use, quote unquote, the Persig knife? And I have in my hand a passage from Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance that we did not actually go over in episode four. But it is a very excellent overview of what the knife means, even though, because this text is a novel, it doesn't provide outright definitions in the context of freestanding claims as what we are trying to do and accomplish in this podcast. Now, for those who have not read the text, a couple of housekeeping notes. This novel is written in the first person from the perspective of a narrator who is not identified. So the way this novel is written is such that the default assumption is that the narrator is indeed the author himself. So in common parlance, when we refer to the author, we refer to the author as Robert Persig, or just Persig. And then the author, the narrator, I should say, uses a nickname to refer to another persona in the story, and the nickname is Phaedrus, which is a name of one of Plato's dialogues, also a character that appears in that particular dialogue. But here it's used as a name. And so what we have here is a passage where Persig is describing what he refers to as Phaedrus's knife. But do take note that what the text calls Phaedrus's knife, Howard and I, in our parlance, recoined as the Persig knife. But functionally, these are the same ideas. For those of you at home, if you have a copy on hand, by all means, feel free to follow along. If not, you can just listen. This is chapter seven of Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, a couple pages in. In my edition, it is bottom of page 96. I should talk now about Phaedrus's knife. It'll help understand some of the things we talked about. The application of this knife, the division of the world into parts and the building of this structure, is something everybody does. All the time, we are aware of millions of things around us. These changing shapes, these burning hills, the sound of the engine, the feel of the throttle, each rock and weed and fence post and piece of debris beside the road. Aware of these things, but not really conscious of them unless there is something unusual, or unless they reflect something we are predisposed to see. We could not possibly be conscious of these things, and remember all of them, because our mind would be so full of useless details, we would be unable to think. From all this awareness, we must select, and what we select and call consciousness is never the same as the awareness, because the process of selection mutates it. We take a handful of sand from the endless landscape of awareness around us and call that handful of sand the world. Once we have the handful of sand, the world of which we are conscious, the process of discrimination goes to work on it. This is the knife. We divide the sand into parts, this and that, here and there, black and white, now and then. 
The discrimination is the division of the conscious universe into parts. The handful of sand looks uniform at first, but the longer we look at it, the more diverse we find it to be. Each grain of sand is different. No two are alike. Some are similar in one way, some are similar in another way. And we can form the sand into separate piles on the basis of this similarity and dissimilarity. Shades of color in different piles, sizes in different piles, grain shapes in different piles, subtypes of grain shapes in different piles, grades of opacity in different piles, and so on, and on, and on. You'd think the process of subdivision and classification would come to an end somewhere, but it doesn't. It just goes on and on. Classical understanding is concerned with the piles and the basis for sorting and interrelating them. Romantic understanding is directed toward the handful of sand before the sorting begins. Both are valid ways of looking at the world, although irreconcilable with each other. What has become an urgent necessity is a way of looking at the world that does violence to neither of these two kinds of understanding and unites them into one. Such an understanding will not reject sand sorting or contemplation of unsorted sand for its own sake. Such an understanding will instead seek to direct attention to the endless landscape from which the sand is taken. That is what Phaedrus, the poor surgeon, was trying to do. To understand what he was trying to do, it's necessary to see that part of the landscape, inseparable from it, which must be understood, is a figure in the middle of it, sorting sand into piles. To see the landscape without seeing this figure is not to see the landscape at all. To reject that part of the Buddha, that attends to the analysis of motorcycles is to miss the Buddha entirely. There is a perennial classical question that asks which part of the motorcycle, which grain of sand in which pile, is the Buddha? Obviously, to ask that question is to look in the wrong direction, for the Buddha is everywhere. But just as obviously to ask the question is to look in the right direction, for the Buddha is everywhere. About the Buddha that exists independently of any analytic thought, much has been said. Some would say way too much, and would question any attempt to add to it. But about the Buddha that exists within analytic thought, and gives that analytic thought its direction, virtually nothing has been said, and there are historic reasons for this. But history keeps happening. And it seems no harm and maybe some positive good to add to our historical heritage with some talk in this area of discourse. When analytic thought, the knife, is applied to experience, something is always killed in the process. That is fairly well understood, at least in the arts. Mark Twain's experience comes to mind, in which after he had mastered the analytic knowledge needed to pilot the Mississippi River, he discovered the river had lost its beauty. Something is always killed. But what is less noticed in the arts, something is always created too. And instead of just dwelling on what is killed, it's important also to see what's created and to see the process as a kind of death birth continuity that is neither good nor bad, but just is. We pass through a town called Marmoth, but John doesn't stop even for a rest, and so we go on. More furnace heat into some badlands, and we cross the border into Montana. A sign by the road announces it. Sylvia waves her arms up and down and I beep the horn in response, but when I look at the sign, my feelings are not jubilant at all. For me, its information causes a sudden inward tension that can't exist for them. There's no way of knowing we're now in the country where he lived. All this talk so far about classic and romantic understanding must seem a strangely oblique way of describing him. But to get at Phaedrus, 
this oblique route is the only one to take. To describe his physical appearance or the statistics of his life would be to dwell on misleading superficialities, and to come at him directly would be to invite disaster. He was insane, and when you look directly at an insane man, all you see is a reflection of your own knowledge that he's insane, which is not to see him at all. To see him, you must see what he saw, and when you are trying to see the vision of an insane man, an oblique route is the only way to come at it. Otherwise, your own opinions block the way. There is only one access to him that I can see as passable, and we still have a way to go. I've been going into all this business of analysis and definitions and hierarchies, not for their own sake, but to lay the groundwork for an understanding of the direction in which Phaedrus went. I told Chris the other night that Phaedrus spent his entire life pursuing a ghost. That was true. The ghost he pursued was the ghost that underlies all of technology, all of modern science, all of Western thought. It was the ghost of rationality itself. I told Chris that he found the ghost, and that when he found it, he thrashed it good. I think in a figurative sense, that is true. The things I hope to bring to light as we go along are some of the things he uncovered. Now, the times are such that others may at last find them of value. No one then would see the ghost that Phaedrus pursued. But I think now that more and more people see it, or get glimpses of it in bad moments, a ghost which calls itself rationality, but whose appearance is that of incoherence and meaninglessness, which causes the most normal of everyday acts to seem slightly mad because of their irrelevance to anything else. This is the ghost of normal everyday assumptions, which declares that the ultimate purpose of life, which is to keep alive, is impossible, but that this is the ultimate purpose of life anyway. So, that great minds struggle to cure diseases so that people may live longer, but only madmen ask why. One lives longer in order that he may live longer. There is no other purpose. That is what the ghost says. In this passage, we see a rather vivid description of the definition that we came to in episode 4 in action. This idea of a knife that comes down and defines things into this and that, black and white, here and there. Once again, a method of decisive subdivision that provides more than one option of analysis. That's not static. That results in something. That leads to a very specific destination. Because... Like Robert Perseg says in the text itself, the subdivision never stops. It just keeps going and going. You can keep creating an infinite number of sand piles in accordance to whatever salient property or characteristic so pleases your fancy. Size, shape, color, opacity, it's all in the text right there. An infinite landscape of sand piles, subdivided little sand piles that all have relations to each other because you divided them from the same thing. It creates a sort of web or, oh gee, I don't know, maybe a grid of sorts. This process is at the core of how generic individuals attempt to make sense of the world. Again, in the text, he says it himself, everybody does this every day. Consciousness would not be possible without this process because, as the text itself says, the alternative is your mind being overwhelmed with endless amounts of detail that you have no ability how to handle. The grid, the sand piles, are the logical consequence of Persig's knife. That's where it leads. Endless sand piles. And like the passage itself says, you hold the sand piles in your hand and that's the world. It is not obvious how to perceive the world absent of the grid. 
Now, given our previous definition of Persig's knife, given this particular reading passage, the idea of grid sand piles and grid might be sufficiently understandable. But here's the next question. Where does Aristotle come into play for this? Why Aristotle's grid? For this, I once again have to return to the text. This is the beginning of chapter 9 of Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, page 128 in my edition. I want to pursue further now that same ghost that Phaedrus pursued, rationality itself, that dull, complex, classical ghost of underlying form. This morning I talked about hierarchies of thought, the system. Now I want to talk about methods of finding one's way through these hierarchies. Logic. Two kinds of logic are used, inductive and deductive. Inductive inferences start with observations of the machine and arrive at general conclusions. For example, if the cycle goes over a bump and the engine misfires, then goes over another bump and the engine misfires, and then goes over another bump and the engine misfires, and then goes over a long, smooth stretch of road and there is no misfiring, and then goes over a fourth bump and the engine misfires again, one can logically conclude that the misfiring is caused by the bumps. That is induction, reasoning from particular experiences to general truths. Deductive inferences do the reverse. They start with general knowledge and predict a specific observation. For example, if, from reading the hierarchy of facts about the machine, the mechanic knows the horn of the cycle is powered exclusively by electricity from the battery, then he can logically infer that if the battery is dead, the horn will not work. That is deduction. Solution of problems too complicated for common sense to solve is achieved by long strings of mixed inductive and deductive inferences that weave back and forth between the observed machine and the mental hierarchy of the machine found in the manuals. The correct program for this interweaving is formalized as scientific method. Actually, I've never seen a cycle maintenance problem complex enough really to require full-scale formal scientific method. Repair problems are not that hard. When I think of formal scientific method, an image sometimes comes to mind of an enormous juggernaut, a huge bulldozer, slow, tedious, lumbering, laborious, but invincible. It takes twice as long five times as long, maybe a dozen times as long as informal mechanics techniques. But you know in the end you're going to get it. There's no fault isolation problem in motorcycle maintenance that can stand up to it. When you've hit a really tough one, tried everything, racked your brain and nothing works, and you know that this time nature has really decided to be difficult, you say, okay nature, that's the end of the nice guy and you crank up the formal scientific method. For this, you keep a lab notebook. Everything gets written down formally, so that you know at all times where you are, where you've been, where you're going, and where you want to get. In scientific work and electronic technology, this is necessary because otherwise the problems get so complex, you get lost in them and confused and forget what you know and what you don't know and have to give up. In cycle maintenance, things are not that involved, but when confusion starts, it's a good idea to hold it down by making everything formal and exact. Sometimes, just the act of writing down the problems straightens out your head as to what they really are. The logical statements entered into the notebook are broken down into six categories. 1. Statement of the problem. 2. Hypothesis as to the cause of the problem. 3. Experiments designed to test each hypothesis. 4. Predicted results of experiments. 5. Observed results of the experiments. And 6. Conclusions from the results of the experiments.
This is not different from the formal arrangement of many college and high school lab notebooks, but the purpose here is no longer just busy work. The purpose now is precise guidance of thoughts that will fail if they are not accurate. The real purpose of scientific method is to make sure nature hasn't misled you into thinking you know something you don't actually know. This careful approach to the beginning questions keeps you from taking a major wrong turn, which might cause you weeks of extra work or can even hang you up completely. Scientific questions often have a surface appearance of dumbness for this reason. They are asked in order to prevent dumb mistakes later on. Whether it's this passage that I just read, or the earlier passage in which Persig is describing Phaedrus' knife, or as we call it, Persig's knife, there is an underlying commonality that creates this image of a grid. The scientific method, as we understand it, is born out of the function of Persig's knife. In other words, no Persig's knife, no grid. But again, why Aristotle? This passage comes from chapter 29 of the novel, just past the middle portion. In my edition, it's towards the bottom of page 477. Plato's hatred of the rhetoricians was part of a much larger struggle in which the reality of the good, represented by the sophists, and the reality of the true, represented by the dialecticians, were engaged in a huge struggle for the future mind of man. Truth won, the good lost, and that is why today we have so little difficulty accepting the reality of truth and so much difficulty accepting the reality of quality even though there is no more agreement in one area than in the other. To understand how Phaedrus arrives at this requires some explanation. One must first get over the idea that the time span between the last cave nan and the first Greek philosophers was short. The absence of any history for this period sometimes gives this illusion. But before the Greek philosophers arrived on the scene, for a period of at least five times all our recorded history since the Greek philosophers, there existed civilizations in an advanced state of development. They had villages and cities, vehicles, houses, marketplaces, bounded fields, agricultural implements, and domestic animals, and led a life quite as rich and varied as that in most rural areas of the world today. And like people in those areas today, they saw no reason to write it all down. Or, if they did, they wrote it on materials that have never been found. Thus, we know nothing about them. The quote-unquote Dark Ages were merely the resumption of a natural way of life that had been momentarily interrupted by the Greeks. Early Greek philosophy represented the first conscious search for what was imperishable in the affairs of men. Up till then, what was imperishable was within the domain of the gods, the myths. But now, as a result of the growing impartiality of the Greeks to the world around them, there was an increasing power of abstraction which permitted them to regard the old Greek mythos not as revealed truth, but as imaginative creations of art. This consciousness, which had never existed anywhere before in the world, spelled a whole new level of transcendence for the Greek civilization. But the mythos goes on, and that which destroys the old mythos becomes the new mythos. And the new mythos under the first Ionian philosophers became transmuted into philosophy, which enshrined permanence in a new way. Permanence was no longer the exclusive domain of the immortal gods. It was also to be found within immortal principles, of which our current law of gravity has become one. The immortal principle was first called water by Thales. Anaximenes called it air. The Pythagoreans called it number, and were thus the first to see the immortal principle as something non-material. Heraclitus called the immortal principle fire, and introduced change as part of the principle. He said the world exists as a conflict and tension of opposites. He said there is a one, and there is a many, 
and the one is the universal law which is imminent in all things. Anaxagoras was the first to identify the one as nous, meaning mind. Parmenides made it clear for the first time that the immortal principle, the one, truth, God, is separate from appearance and from opinion. And the importance of this separation and its effect upon subsequent history cannot be overstated. It's here that the classic mind, for the first time, took leave of its romantic origins and said, the good and the true are not necessarily the same, and goes its separate way. Anaxagoras and Parmenides had a listener named Socrates who carried their ideas into full fruition. What is essential to understand at this point is that until now, there was no such thing as mind and matter, subject and object, form and substance. Those divisions are just dialectical inventions that came later. The modern mind sometimes tends to balk at the thought of these dichotomies being inventions and says, well, the divisions were there for the Greeks to discover. And you have to say, where were they? Point to them. And the modern mind gets a little confused and wonders what this is all about anyway, and still believes the divisions were there. At this point, I pause in the reading to provide a minor commentary about how this passage relates back to the earlier passages that I was talking about, particularly with regards to the Persic knife, the method of subdivision. This is all interrelated. I continue the reading. But they weren't, as Phaedrus said. They are just ghosts, immortal gods of the modern mythos, which appear to us to be real because we are in that mythos. But in reality, they are just as much an artistic creation as the anthropomorphic gods they replaced. The pre-Socratic philosophers mentioned so far all sought to establish a universal immortal principle in the external world they found around them. Their common effort united them in a group that may be called cosmologists. They all agreed that such a principle existed, but their disagreements as to what it was seemed irresolvable. The followers of Heraclitus insisted the immortal principle was change and motion. But Parmenides' disciple, Zeno, proved through a series of paradoxes that any perception of motion and change is illusory. Reality had to be motionless. The resolution of the arguments of the cosmologists came from a new direction entirely, from a group Phaedrus seemed to feel were early humanists. They were teachers, but what they sought to teach was not principles, but beliefs of men. Their object was not any single absolute truth, but the improvement of men. All principles, all truths, are relative, they said. Man is the measure of all things. These were the famous teachers of quote-unquote wisdom, the sophists of ancient Greece. To Phaedrus, this backlight from the conflict between the sophists and the cosmologists adds an entirely new dimension to the dialogues of Plato. Socrates is not just expounding noble ideas in a vacuum. He is in the middle of a war between those who think truth is absolute and those who think truth is relative. He is fighting that war with everything he has. The sophists are the enemy. Now, Plato's hatred of the sophists makes sense. He and Socrates are defending the immortal principle of the cosmologists against what they consider to be the decadence of the sophists. Truth, knowledge, that which is independent of what anyone thinks about it. The ideal that Socrates died for, the ideal that Greece alone possesses for the first time in the history of the world, it is still a very fragile thing. It can disappear completely. Plato abhors and damns the sophists without restraint, not because they are low and immoral people. There are obviously much lower and more immoral people in Greece he completely ignores. He damns them because they threaten mankind's first beginning grasp of the idea of truth. That's what it is all about. I skip ahead to page 486 in my edition. 
The halo around the heads of Plato and Socrates is now gone. He sees that they consistently are doing exactly that which they accuse the sophists of doing, using emotionally persuasive language for the ulterior purpose of making the weaker argument. The case for dialectic appeared the stronger. We always condemn most in others, he thought, that which we most fear in ourselves. But why? Phaedrus wondered. Why destroy Arete? And no sooner had he asked the question than the answer came to him. Plato hadn't tried to destroy Arete. He had encapsulated it, made a permanent fixed idea out of it, had converted it into a rigid, immobile, immortal truth. He made Arete the good, the highest form, the highest idea of all. It was subordinate only to truth itself in the synthesis of all that had gone before. That was why the quality that Phaedrus had arrived at in the classroom had seemed so close to Plato's good. Plato's good was taken from the rhetoricians. Phaedrus searched, but could find no previous cosmologist who had talked about the good. That was from the sophists. The difference was that Plato's good was a fixed and eternal and unmoving idea, whereas for the rhetoricians it was not an idea at all. The good was not a form of reality, it was reality itself, ever-changing, ultimately unknowable in any kind of fixed, rigid way. Why had Plato done this? Phaedrus saw Plato's philosophy as a result of two syntheses. The first synthesis tried to resolve differences between the Heraclitans and the followers of Parmenides. Both cosmological schools upheld immortal truth. In order to win the battle for truth in which Arete is subordinate against his enemies who would teach Arete in which truth is subordinate, Plato must first resolve the internal conflict among the truth believers. To do this, he says that immortal truth is not just change, as the followers of Heraclitus said. It is not just changeless being, as the followers of Parmenides said. But both immortal truths coexist as ideas which are changeless and appearance which changes. This is why Plato finds it necessary to separate, for example, hoarseness from horse, and to say that hoarseness is real and fixed and true and unmoving, while the horse is a mere unimportant transitory phenomenon. Hoarseness is pure idea. The horse that one sees is a collection of changing appearances. A horse that can flux and move all around at once and even die on the spot without disturbing hoarseness, which is the immortal principle that can go on forever in the path of the gods of old. Plato's second synthesis is the incorporation of the sophist's arete into this dichotomy of ideas and appearance. He gives it the position of highest honor, subordinate only to truth itself, and the method by which truth is arrived at, the dialectic. But in his attempt to unite the good and the true by making the good the highest idea of all, Plato is nevertheless usurping Arete's place with dialectically determined truth. Once the good has been contained as a dialectical idea, it is no trouble for another philosopher to come along and show by dialectical methods that Arete, the good, can be more advantageously demoted to a lower position within a true order of things, more compatible with the inner workings of dialectic. Such a philosopher was not long in coming. His name was Aristotle. Aristotle felt that the mortal horse of appearance which ate grass and took people places and gave birth to little horses deserved far more attention than Plato was giving it. He said that the horse is not mere appearance, Appearances cling to something which is independent of them and which, like ideas, is unchanging. The something that appearances cling to is named substance. And at that moment, and not until that moment, our modern scientific understanding of reality was born. Under Aristotle, The reader, whose knowledge of Trojan Arete seems conspicuously absent, forms and substances dominate all. The good is a relatively minor branch of knowledge called ethics. Reason, logic, knowledge, 
are his primary concerns. Arete is dead, and science, logic, and the university as we know it today have been given their founding charter. To find and invent an endless proliferation of forms about substantive elements of the world and call these forms knowledge, and transmit these forms to future generations as, quote-unquote, the system. And rhetoric. Poor rhetoric. Once learning itself now becomes reduced to the teaching of mannerisms and forms, Aristotelian forms, for writing as if these mattered. Five spelling errors, Phaedrus just remembered, or one error of sentence completeness, or three misplaced modifiers, or it went on and on. Any of these was sufficient to inform a student that he did not know rhetoric. After all, that's what rhetoric is, isn't it? Of course, there's quote-unquote empty rhetoric, that is, rhetoric that has emotional appeal without proper subservience to dialectical truth. But we don't want any of that, do we? That would make us like those liars and cheats and defilers of ancient Greece. The sophists! You remember them? We'll learn truth in our other academic courses, and then learn a little rhetoric so that we can write it nicely and impress our bosses who will advance us to higher positions. Forms and mannerisms, hated by the best, loved by the worst. Year after year, decade after decade, of little front row readers, mimics with pretty smiles and neat pens, out to get their Aristotelian A's, while those who possess the real arete sit silently in the back of them, wondering what is wrong with themselves, that they cannot like this subject. And today, in those few universities that bother to teach classic ethics anymore, students following the lead of Aristotle and Plato endlessly play around with the question that in ancient Greece never needed to be asked. What is the good? And how do we define it? Since different people have defined it differently, how can we know there is any good? Some say the good is found in happiness, but how do we know what happiness is? And how can happiness be defined? Happiness and good are not objective terms. We cannot deal with them scientifically. And since they aren't objective, they just exist in your mind. So if you want to be happy, just change your mind. Ha 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 ha. Aristotelian ethics. Aristotelian definitions. Aristotelian logic. Aristotelian forms. Aristotelian substances. Aristotelian rhetoric. Aristotelian laughter. Ha ha. Ha ha. And the bones of the sophists long ago turned to dust, and what they said turned to dust with them, and the dust was buried under a rubble of declining Athens, through its fall in Macedonia, through its decline and fall, through the decline and death of ancient Rome and Byzantium and the Ottoman Empire and the modern states, buried so deep and with such ceremoniousness and such unction and such evil that only a madman centuries later could discover the clues needed to uncover them and see with horror what had been done. The text itself says, the halo around Socrates' head and Plato's head are gone. He makes no bones about what he thinks of Aristotle either. At a bare minimum, the connection between the Persic knife and what it turns into as a grid is unambiguously identifiable with Aristotle. Aristotle's grid. The endless subdivision of things. Now, at this point in the podcast, I need to back up a little bit because the normative indictment of this dialectical thought, the rationality in and of itself, as it is described in this text, is clear. And part of the reason why this book easily ranks as one of my favorite books of all time, probably my favorite novel that I have ever read, is that it articulates and describes an indictment of what generic individuals call Western thought in a way that I intuitively understood in my youth, but that I was never able to articulate. However, 
we need to be very careful with this. The substance of this indictment is weighty. It is not light, but you cannot skip to it because disaster happens if you levy that indictment improperly. The person knife and the Aristotelian grid that it creates is, as I read in one of the earlier passages, a juggernaut, a slow, lumbering, unstoppable juggernaut that encapsulates all things, at least supposedly. The grid that results from somebody who is intelligent wielding Persig's knife is a Goliath that crushes everything underfoot, encapsulates everything. Nothing escapes. It is the bedrock of what we in modern times understand to be the scientific method. If you don't have the person knife, if you don't have Aristotle's grid, you have no science. It says so in the text, the line that said, and the modern university as we know it today was given its founding charter. These ideas are inseparable. But we must tread carefully because although it is possible to levy a legitimate critique and criticism of rationality, which is an echo of what we talked about in previous episodes with the shaman and the idea of unarticulated understanding, which we will be revisiting here as well. If you do it incorrectly, you are left with relativism. You are left with nihilism. You are left in a situation where you are completely disconnected from the logos. So, what then is the correct way to proceed? How do we explore the limitations of Aristotle's grid, which is the ultimate metaphorical representation of, as Phaedrus in the book says, rationality itself? How do we navigate the limitations of this system in a way that does not leave us disconnected from the Logos? Well, I might have a few ideas. For one thing, we need to be very clear about whether or not we are in normative territory or descriptive territory. And we need to respect the sequence of those things. We need to have a solid descriptive understanding of the term Aristotle's grid before we can start constructing a normative understanding of Aristotle's grid. So earlier I was talking about the drifting nature of this episode. It's because, yes, technically this episode of the podcast is primarily concerned with really just one term, Aristotle's grid. But just from reading these few select passages from Robert Persig's novel, I hope it is self-evident that the weight behind this term, the weight behind this idea, is not to be trifled with. What is Aristotle's grid? Well, for one thing, it is the inevitable result of Persig's knife, or Phaedrus's knife, to use the book's terms. It is the ultimate representation of rationality itself. Okay, well, these are descriptive claims. But to ask a familiar question, are these definitions or are they mere descriptions? After reading all of these passages, the image of Persig's knife subdividing into infinity, and then the results of that subdivision being the very substance of the world, because that's the only thing that you can see, should be clear by now. All right, well, what is that? How do you define that? Without the answer to these questions, I don't see a way out of the descriptive territory. Because, I already said this, if we don't get a handle on the descriptive material surrounding this term, Aristotle's grid, we leave the door open for the monkey from episode 6 to come in and destroy rationality entirely. So, that's my opener. You're indicating that 
now is the time for me to respond. Take your chance, otherwise I'm going to keep going. I wish that there was something a little bit more specific to which you were looking for a response. There are several things I could respond to. I could even respond to the last thing that you were saying with regards to the character that is the monkey destroying rationality. Because there's no way to rationally destroy rationality. So there's no way to rationally attack rationality unless that's the most rational thing to do. I don't see a way around that. But that's subsumed within the grid. So the Persig text is appropriate. For the way that we use this term, considering that the term arose from exactly this passage, particularly the last one where it says such a philosopher was not long in coming. And this passage succinctly describes a situation where everything falls into its proper place with its proper order because it's properly organized. I also want to note that this is not an indictment against proper organization. That's what the character of the monkey would do. This is an indictment against saying proper organization is completely sufficient and cannot be distinguished from anything. There are several very curious parts about this passage. For example, the description of the sophist. Sophist. It's a very unique formulation that he has in my experience with the term sophistry. But the point isn't to say that the scientific method isn't valuable. It's to say that there is a place to divide the scientific method from something else. And that's the main purpose of a lot of the text in this novel. It's not to say that proper organization doesn't have its place. It has to. The problem is to say that the scientific method can account for the procedure of all tasks, and it can't. As Persig points out, particularly because the scientific method can't account for that which generates the ability to create hypotheses. You're having a problem because the only way to define the source of all things is to use terms that have already come from the source. So you can never actually define the source directly. It's always an indirect description. And one of the things that comes from the ability to specify is the ability to organize those specifications. Once the information is attained, the information is stored in a location of sorts because, well, information needs to be accessed. That's the nature of organization. Do you have what you need when you need it? So when I need this information, do I have that information at the point in time when that information is relevant? Or is it in a place where I'm not going to be able to find it and then I have to rederive it or I don't have it? So I need to go spend additional resources locating it because it's not where it should be. Of course you need the knife in order to get to the grid because the decisive distinctions between two things allow for the proper specification and the proper location of whatever's been divided. To acknowledge the grid is to acknowledge and recognize a functional means of subdivision. Your question seems to be, where does the normative claim apply? It's not really a question. I think I know the boundaries of which entry point that comes into play. So by way of example, I have, from that monologue, a provisional definition of the term Aristotle's grid. And I need to know if this definition meets the threshold of adequacy or if it needs to be ripped apart and tried again. Because I can't tell. State the definition, please. A system of worldview construction that seeks to subdivide and or categorize all relevant information. Now, allow me to explain the reason why I cannot tell if this definition works. My confusion arises from a very specific place, and I do not have a procedure to sort out 
how to bring the Persic knife down on that which is or is not the case in terms of what needs to go where. So whatever cross-examination is levied against this provisional definition must be able to account for the source of my confusion. Which is? It comes from two things. Number one is that it comes from a principle from one of the founding members of the intellectual dark web, Eric Weinstein. He mentions this a few times on his podcast and a couple of interviews he's done. But one of the things he says is, all true maps must align. Now, this is a very concise, very succinct, very portable axiom to describe a necessary situation in which two claims that are both true cannot be in conflict with each other. You cannot have two mutually exclusive statements and have them both be true. They can both be false. One of them can be true and the other one can be false, but they both cannot be true if they are mutually contradictory. Any two statements, three statements, four statements, X number of statements that are true must all be able to coexist. Let's see if we can derive and construct a really dumb example. For example, take the following two statements. Statement number one, Fido is a dog. Statement number two, Fido has fur. These two statements abide by the principle of all true maps must align. It is perfectly feasible for both of these statements to be true at the exact same time. They can both be false. Either one of them can be false. But if they are both true, there are no problems. They can coexist. Take that in comparison with the following pairing. Statement number one, Fido is a dog. Statement number two, Fido is cold-blooded. These are statements that do not abide by this principle. These are contradictory statements. It's not possible for both of these statements to be true at the exact same time. If Fido is a dog, inherent in the idea of dog is warm-blooded. There's no such thing as a cold-blooded dog. If Fido is cold-blooded, then he cannot possibly be a dog. One of these has to be false. These are statements, these are metaphorical maps that do not align. And I like Eric Weinstein's metaphorical use of the term map because principles, like in the way that a paper map or a digital map, a map on our phone or a map on the computer or whatever, helps us understand a certain geographical space so too do axioms and principles help us understand a certain space in which there are uncertainties, in which there are magic TV problems, in which there is just information that you don't know. And you're trying to get your hands around something, you're trying to understand something in the same way that maps are useful tools to help us understand physical space, principles and axioms are helpful tools to understand conceptual space. And so in that way, there's a sort of relationship between the idea of a map and an axiom. So all true maps must align. That's a very easy metaphorical description to understand. But what we're doing is that we're using that principle, we're using that metaphorical language to understand how axioms function how freestanding claims function. Much in the same way of how we were talking about relative pitch in previous episodes, it is possible to correlate freestanding claims against each other. So that's one aspect of my confusion. So number one is the principle of all true maps must align. Well, in order to have a map, it seems to me that you need to be able to have some kind of taxonomy in which you can compare different things. What goes where? What belongs to what category? 
a taxonomy of concepts and a taxonomy of ideas seems to necessitate the use of the Persing knife. It has to come down somewhere. Now, that is juxtaposed against something in the text in and of itself. Specifically, in my edition on page 317. It's a comparison between two different hierarchy charts. I'll start with the paragraph just immediately preceding it on page 316. Now we had two different kinds of quality, but they no longer split quality itself. They were just two different time aspects of quality, short and long. What had previously been asked for was a metaphysical hierarchy that looked like this. And then on the next page, we see at the very top a central node called reality, and then reality subdivides into subjective, parentheses mental, and objective, parentheses physical, and then under the subjective mode, it further subdivides into classical and romantic, and then it goes down from there. And then he goes on to say, what he gave them in turn was a metaphysical hierarchy that looked like this. So at the very top, in the central node is quality, parentheses, reality, and then that subdivides into romantic quality, parentheses, pre-intellectual reality, and classic quality, parentheses, intellectual reality. So hold your horses there, Persig. For all your railing against Aristotle and his grid, you have a very nice little chart delineation there that very neatly explains what the entire problem was that you've been wrestling with throughout the entirety of this book. I don't know how to generate a definition of the term Aristotle's grid that simultaneously accomplishes A, accounting for its inherent deficiencies as Persig describes it in the text, and B, allows for its value to be acknowledged in such a way that the monkey from episode six can't just reject it and do away with it at will, with relativism or nihilism or what have you. I don't know how to do that, and I don't even know how to go about starting to create the procedure that would even bring us closer to that objective. Well, Percy, throughout the entirety of the novel, does address the self-referential coherency question, particularly when he's referring to analyzing forms of analysis. So basically, there's a form of analysis that's being applied to analysis itself in order to find the problems with the standard methods of analysis, although apparently the standard methods of analysis can be used on analysis itself to reveal the holes that would perpetuate the improvement of itself as a term, itself being analysis. So the grid is useful. When we use the term Aristotle's grid, we're not using it as a... Pejorative. Correct. Aristotle's grid, the term, is very much defined by that which the term is distinguished from. When we're using the term Aristotle's grid between ourselves, very commonly what we're pointing out is a category of information that is not X. Persig has no problem identifying the utility of the grid and using the grid to identify the utility of the grid. Which is evidenced by the passage in which he is describing the scientific method as the juggernaut. Persig respects the scientific method. Persig is using a form of the grid to rearrange the chart that you were referring to. The grid itself is not inherently a problem that needs to be done away with. That's the danger. The grid has immense utility, and the grid is necessary, and the grid is often fantastic, and the grid is often good or at least what's contained within it, is often good. But the grid is simply an organizational system. The grid is an organizational system that is distinguished from X. And Persig's problem, again, is that this organizational system is not itself unable to be distinguished, frankly, from anything. Persig's frustration and descriptions about the monotony of the consequences of Aristotle's grid those consequences and that monotony come from the inability to distinguish the grid from the not grid. By not grid, you're referring to that which exists outside the grid. Well, right, because the monotony exists when the entire structure of reality is under the grid. There is no reality beyond the grid. 
If it's not in the grid, it's not real. Another way to rephrase that would be to say, essentially, that the grid and reality are the same. That which is under the grid is the world, and that which is not under the grid is not worth considering. That's what leads to problems with trying to understand the question of, well, for example, what's the best part of the grid to locate? Or how can the grid be improved? There has to be another way to measure other than what's in the grid itself. There has to be something outside of the grid in order to ask the question of what's best. Which is why if you only operate underneath the grid, you have a problem with consistent interactions with the logos. The way that Percy describes it is that the insistence of reality being defined as that which exists within the grid destroys the ability to acknowledge what is and isn't good. It destroys the connection to the good. And the solution to that isn't to destroy the entire grid. The solution to that is to put the grid itself into its own square to be distinguished from something else. So you can access the grid. You can access the network. You can access the system that allows you to organize. But you still need a mechanism, you need a method to proceed once you have access to that information. You also need the best place in the grid to get access to that information. And you're talking about all true maps must align. I'm also myself talking about references to the locations of information and the grid itself being a kind of map. The example about Fido being a dog and Fido having fur, that can be contained within the organizational system of the grid and within the grid, the location of Fido being a dog and the location of Fido having fur aligns. And this is all subsumed under the grid. The grid becomes a kind of conceptual map of what to do with the consequences of properly specifying distinctions. So the subdivision and the categorization of all relevant information that is what this organizational system seeks to accomplish. But an organizational system is a reference to infrastructure. There's no data. There's the potential location for data within the infrastructure. Even if I take an example like creating a simple spreadsheet, which is a grid if there ever was one, there's a place for all that data to go but it needs to be decisive in how the grid is divided and defined. And you need to be able to find the information that you need. And the data can be manipulated in such a way where it can very efficiently give you calculations and data that you need exactly at the right time. If things are not properly divided and the parts of your spreadsheet don't align, then your data is going to give you errors and you're going to be making plans based on things that you don't actually understand or things that are just wrong. Well, Persig talks about that in the section where he's talking about the scientific method about preventing against nature tricking you into believing something that you don't actually know. Well, sure, but my point about the spreadsheets is also more to say that a spreadsheet is very decisive in how the cells are divided from each other. If I was just going to try and stretch this analogy a little bit further, just because someone has a spreadsheet full of data doesn't mean that there's anything that you can do with it. Even if everything in that spreadsheet is correct, that doesn't mean that there's any use for it. Maybe there is, but the usefulness of that data is very specific to the ability to generate the best outcomes and to generate the best information that can be harvested from that data or the best location to go in that data but the ability to determine useful information is not contained within the data. It's outside of the data. It's the person looking at the data that needs the useful information that determines what the useful information is. That's the entity that does something with the data because the data just otherwise sits there. It doesn't really care. Okay, so how does this help bring us closer to a proper, a sufficient, a functional definition of the term Aristotle's grid? Well, Aristotle's grid is not a system of worldview construction because it can be, but the term Aristotle's grid is not a pejorative. If it was a means of worldview construction, then this term would be used to describe 
problems in pathology only. Even someone who does construct a worldview which states that everything under the grid is all that exists. First of all, that can't be the case because of the category that is unarticulated knowledge. Everything in the grid is specified. Everything in the grid is specified, articulated information that's very specifically placed in a certain location. Someone who does build a worldview using this system of subdividing and categorizing all relevant information, they're going to be very proficient and very good in some areas and completely horrifying in other areas. So Aristotle's grid is a system that is necessary but not sufficient. So it's a necessary but not sufficient system of organization, which one, subdivides and categorizes all relevant information, and two, must be distinguished from X. When we talk about Aristotle's grid, we talk about putting something into the grid, which is just a way to refer to a conclusion that's being stoically organized, or a conclusion that's the result of science. Is Aristotle's grid and articulated knowledge in actuality just the same thing? Because if it is the same thing, then the X that you describe as that is distinguished from X just becomes unarticulated knowledge. Well, it's not simply articulated knowledge. There needs to be a reference to infrastructure. So with the spreadsheet example, then the articulated knowledge would be the data that goes into the spreadsheet. The grid would be the mechanism that is the empty spreadsheet that can receive and hold data. The mechanism is not the entity that enters the data into it. It doesn't fill itself with data. I mean, it kind of does sometimes, but generally speaking, even when it fills itself with data, it was filled with data to be able to do so by this outside entity that is not the empty spreadsheet itself, which is simply to say an empty spreadsheet doesn't fill itself. This also works for maps. For example, if a paper map of an area, that the paper is there, that there's a method, and there's a system to document and properly organize the location of whatever's in that region onto the paper. So the articulated knowledge would be the things that need to be organized, the things that need to go onto the paper, the actual locations of the things, the information itself. The articulated knowledge would be this mountain exists here. So how do you put it onto a paper in such a way where you actually remember it? Well, that's when you have to start subdividing and you have to start categorizing and you have to start labeling mountains in a certain way and you have to put it at a certain place on the paper. That's the organizational system. I would also say that acknowledging a skill set that you do not yet possess, which would be a kind of acknowledging of the unknown to say that I know that I don't know something, for example, that's a form of articulated knowledge. It's a weak form of articulated knowledge, but it is categorically articulated knowledge. It doesn't go really past that acknowledgement, but it's a very clearly specified skill set that I, for example, do not possess. One of the problems as well that you're trying to account for is essentially someone saying, I can get all of my data from what's already in the spreadsheet. And then when the question is posed, well, how does data get into the spreadsheet in the first place? The response is either a denial of the ability to alter the spreadsheet or some kind of appeal to destroying the infrastructure of all spreadsheets. Neither of which work. No, of course not. But it's a very frustrating problem that I've encountered as well, more often than I wish, where people would, for example, try to tell me that there's no such thing as originality. Essentially, all there is to do has already been done before. These kinds of statements irk me to no end because the thing that these people are using as the examples of that which already existed needed to be created originally at some point. There's no way to denigrate originality citing that which already exists, which only exists by means of originality. So we are left at the current moment. Aristotle's grid. A necessary but not sufficient organizational system that seeks to subdivide and or categorize all relevant information that is also distinguished from X. Is that what we're working with right now? It's closer. So something that definitely would be 
in Aristotle's grid would really be any scientific conclusion. Do you want to say yeah, but it's a not, map? It's not only scientific conclusions that are... That well, no, I'm just looking for an example. So I need an example of something that's definitely in Aristotle's grid so that I can have an example of something that's definitely not. The closest that we've been able to come so far is to say that the spreadsheet doesn't fill itself because there needs to be something outside of the spreadsheet in order to actually put the data into it. So you, you can't say that all things come from the spreadsheet. You're saying that you need a thumb down example of a statement that exists squarely within Aristotle's grid. I believe so. By way of example, if you have one, then yeah. Sure, all dogs are mammals. All right. Let me ask you this question as well. When you said that you knew where to insert the normative aspects of this definition, where do the normative aspects go? Not the normative aspects of the definition, but rather the normative commentaries on Aristotle's grid in and of itself. I don't think that the definition of the term Aristotle's grid does or should contain any normative aspects. It should be just descriptive. It has to. Then if it has to be descriptive, then it's a necessary but not sufficient organizational system, which seeks to subdivide and categorize all relevant information. That's it. The fact that it must be distinguished from something is not contained within the grid and is not necessary to actually include the definition. It doesn't matter that Persig had problems with the grid. It doesn't matter that there are problems with the grid and that there are times that you should use the grid and times that you should not use the grid if we're going to make an entirely descriptive definition. If you're going to say that the grid is distinguished from X, that's a normative part of the definition. It must be distinguished from X. It might be redundant. I understand what it is that you're saying, and I understand what it is that you're getting at. However, I think we are arriving at a place where we need to go back into some lateral drifting because it's still not clear to me the imperative behind what you're identifying to be the necessity to include the normative aspect into the definition of Aristotle's grid. So perhaps we need to drift around what the limitations of Aristotle's grid actually are before we can make the call as to whether or not the aforementioned normative aspects ought to be included in the definition. So we've known each other for years. And there is no mystery between the two of us about what my stance and what my commentary has been on what we, or what broader society colloquially refers to as Western civilization, Western culture. If you remember to about the four to five month period before you started reading this novel, multiple instances were coming up where I was appealing to terms that Persig was using in this novel. And you would just look at me and you would say, I don't know what that means. What's the definition of that? You were trying to bring the knife down on the terms that I was using at the time. You were trying to put the terms that I was using into Aristotle's grid. And it just got to a point where I just said, you just got to get a copy and you have to read this. I'm at my capacity to be able to explain what this is. You asked me something to the effect of what was my core motivation behind recommending the book? Why was it that this novel occupied such a high position on the hierarchy of books that I have read? And one of the things that I said at the time was, this book encapsulated, articulated, and explained a criticism of Western thought and the Western intellectual tradition that I have understood from the time of my adolescence, but I have hitherto been unable to successfully explain to third parties. Now, I referenced this story because one of the things that we were talking about at that time was the idea of the Western intellectual tradition, what it means to be a Westerner. And when I began my initial commentaries on that, you said to me, what does it mean to be Western versus non-Western? 
how do you bring the knife down? We weren't using that terminology at the time, but translating into the parlance of what we now in contemporary times have access to. You asked me the functional equivalent of how do you bring the knife down on that which qualifies as Western versus that which qualifies as not Western? And that's when the reference to Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance switched from, oh, there's this book that I read that has this thing. It turned from passing reference into a very vehement insistence on, Howard, you need to read this book. So there are two specific passages in this book that I think can simultaneously do two different jobs. Number one is it very clearly delineates what it was that we were talking about during that time, because I don't think we have ever formally returned to that line of inquiry since then in any kind of significant capacity. So it'll be an interesting capstone to sort of go back in time and revisit those early days of when we were having that conversation. Now that we both have read the book from cover to cover, and now we can look at the two passages in the book that I will read momentarily. But also, and this is the second job, my suspicion is that by acknowledging your initial questions to me of, well, why don't you consider yourself a Westerner? We can use that as a tool to unlock the current question of whether or not the normative aspect of what we were just discussing needs to be included in the definition of Aristotle's grid or if we can just leave the definition of Aristotle's grid in purely descriptive terms, and then the normative aspect can then exist as an independent commentary, which is kind of how it exists in my mind at the moment. Do you have anything to say before we proceed? If you have nothing to say, I'll crack open the book and start the passage reading. You're beginning to discuss elements of the term Aristotle's grid that I would not use. So I'm getting confused because the definition of the term that we're supposed to be defining is changing. Elaborate. The term Aristotle's grid, whenever we refer to Aristotle's grid or we refer to something going into the grid, it's not clear to me what the placement of something into the grid has to do with what is or isn't Western insofar as we would use the term. So I don't know how to connect what is or isn't Western back to the term in the way that we would actually use the term. Because when we use the term, we're basically referring to some kind of mechanical organizational system. This goes back to my earlier concern about having to simultaneously navigate two separate objectives when it comes to constructing a functional definition of the term Aristotle's grid. Acknowledging the limitations of the organizational structure and then the chart that Persig himself provides on page 317 in our edition of the text. Right, but whenever we use the term to say that this goes into Aristotle's grid, we're always using it as something that appropriately is placed into Aristotle's grid. We're using it to acknowledge that which is appropriately categorized. So if you want to start talking about the things that are inappropriately categorized, that's fine, but we're going to need another term for that. It's worth knowing that there exists a category of things which are inappropriately categorized. But what we do by using the term Aristotle's grid is we're referring to a thing that is appropriately categorized when we encounter it. I see. So the strategy is to do to the term Aristotle's grid what we did to the term epistemic problem, epistemic card. I think that these ideas and these concepts are very important to be able to acknowledge, but I dare say we're putting the term Aristotle's grid into Aristotle's grid, which is where it should go. I risk using the term in the definition by saying that. But regarding the proper understanding of the term Aristotle's grid and its definition, it's not clear to me that the questions of Western and non-Western have anything to do with that at all. Okay. I am going to insist that we look at one of the passages that I have on hand. But before I start reading the passage, I'm going to present the question. 
and I really don't know the answer to this, but does Aristotle's grid inherently have a normative value, whether positive or negative, or is it just completely descriptive? Does it have a normative value as applied to the term completely, as in Aristotle's grid ought to exist? Where are you inserting the normative parts of this? The short answer to the question is I don't know. Okay. Let me read the passage and maybe it will shine some more light on the question. I actually was thinking about another question that I had that might be the same question. I have it here, so I'm just going to wait until you get to what you want, and then I'm going to ask you this question and see if it's rephrasing the same thing that you're getting at. Okay. So this passage begins right at the outset of chapter 10. So page 136 in our edition. I'm just going to start on the second paragraph from the top of chapter 10. We're also at a kind of beginning point in the things I'm discussing at which one can at least start to talk about Phaedrus's break from the mainstream of rational thought in pursuit of the ghost of rationality itself. There was a passage he had read and repeated to himself so many times it survives intact. It begins, In the temple of science there are many mansions, and various indeed are they that dwell within and the motives that have led them there. Many take to science out of a joyful sense of superior intellectual power, Science is their own special sport, to which they look for vivid experience and the satisfaction of ambition. Many others are to be found in the temple who have offered the products of their brains on this altar for purely utilitarian purposes. Were an angel of the Lord to come and drive all the people belonging to those two categories out of the temple, it would be noticeably emptier, but there would still be some men of both present and past times left inside. If the types we have just expelled were the only types there were, the temple would never have existed any more than one can have a wood consisting of nothing but creepers. Those who have found favor with the angel are somewhat odd, uncommunicative, solitary fellows, really less like each other than the hosts of the rejected. What has brought them to the temple, no single answer will cover. Escape from everyday life, with its painful crudity and hopeless dreariness, from the fetters of one's own shifting desires. A finely tempered nature longs to escape from its noisy, cramped surroundings into the silence of the high mountains where the eye ranges freely through the still pure air and fondly traces out of the restful contours apparently built for eternity. The passage is from a 1918 speech by a young German scientist named Albert Einstein. Phaedrus had finished his first year of university science at the age of 15. His field was already biochemistry, and he intended to specialize at the interface between the organic and inorganic worlds now known as molecular biology. He didn't think of this as a career for his own personal advancement. He was very young, and it was a kind of noble idealistic goal. The state of mind which enables a man to do work of this kind is akin to that of the religious worshiper or lover. The daily effort comes from no deliberate intention or program, but straight from the heart. If Phaedrus had entered science for ambitious or utilitarian purposes, it might never have occurred to him to ask questions about the nature of a scientific hypothesis as an entity in itself, but he did ask them and was unsatisfied with the answers. The formation of hypotheses is the most mysterious of all the categories of scientific method. Where they come from, no one knows. A person is sitting somewhere, minding his own business, and suddenly, flash, he understands something he didn't understand before. Until it's tested, the hypothesis isn't truth, for the tests aren't its source. The source is somewhere else. Einstein had said, Man tries to make for himself, in the fashion that suits him best, a simplified and intelligible picture of the world. He then tries to some extent to substitute this cosmos of his for the world of experience, and thus to overcome it. He makes this cosmos and its construction the pivot of his emotional life in order to find in this way the peace and serenity which he cannot find in the narrow whirlpool of personal experience. 
The supreme task is to arrive at those universal elementary laws from which the cosmos can be built up by pure deduction. There is no logical path to these laws, only intuition, resting on sympathetic understanding of experience, can reach them. Intuition? Sympathy? Strange words for the origin of scientific knowledge. A lesser scientist than Einstein might have said, but scientific knowledge comes from nature. Nature provides the hypotheses. But Einstein understood that nature does not. Nature provides only experimental data. A lesser mind might then have said, well then, man provides the hypotheses. But Einstein denied this too. Nobody, he said, who has really gone into the matter will deny that in practice the world of phenomena uniquely determines the theoretical system, in spite of the fact that there is no theoretical bridge between phenomena and their theoretical principles. Phaedrus's break occurred when, as a result of laboratory experience, he became interested in hypotheses as entities in themselves. He had noticed again and again in his lab work that what might seem to be the hardest part of scientific work, thinking up the hypotheses, was invariably the easiest. The act of formally writing everything down precisely and clearly seemed to suggest them. As he was testing hypothesis number one by experimental method, a flood of other hypotheses would come to mind. And as he was testing these, some more came to mind. And as he was testing these, still more came to mind until it became painfully evident that as he continued testing hypotheses and eliminating them or confirming them, their number did not decrease. It actually increased as he went along. At first, he found this amusing. He coined a law intended to have the humor of a Parkinson's law that the number of rational hypotheses that can explain any given phenomenon is infinite. It pleased him never to run out of hypotheses. Even when his experimental work seemed dead end in every conceivable way, he knew that if he just sat down and muddled about it long enough, sure enough, another hypothesis would come along. And it always did. It was only months after he had coined the law that he began to have some doubts about the humor or benefits of it. If true, that law was not a minor flaw in scientific reasoning. The law is completely nihilistic. It is a catastrophic logical disproof of the general validity of all scientific method. If the purpose of scientific method is to select from among a multitude of hypotheses, and if the number of hypotheses grows faster than experimental method can handle, then it is clear that all hypotheses can never be tested. If all hypotheses cannot be tested, then the results of any experiment are inconclusive and the entire scientific method falls short of its goal of establishing proven knowledge. About this, Einstein had said, evolution has shown that at any given moment, out of all conceivable constructions, a single one has always proved itself absolutely superior to the rest, and let it go at that. But, to Phaedrus, that was an incredibly weak answer. The phrase, at any given moment, really shook him. Did Einstein really mean to state that truth was a function of time? To state that would annihilate the most basic presumption of all science. But there it was, the whole history of science, a clear story of continuously new and changing explanations of old facts. The time spans of permanence seemed completely random. He could see no order in them. Some scientific truths seemed to last for centuries, others for less than a year. Scientific truth was not dogma, good for eternity, but a temporal quantitative entity that could be studied like anything else. He studied scientific truths, then became upset even more by the apparent cause of their temporal condition. It looked as though the time spans of scientific truths are an inverse function of the intensity of scientific effort. Thus, the scientific truths of the 20th century 
seem to have a much shorter lifespan than those of the last century because scientific activity is now much greater. If, in the next century, scientific activity increases tenfold, then the life expectancy of any scientific truth can be expected to drop to perhaps one-tenth as long as now. What shortens the lifespan of the existing truth is the volume of hypotheses offered to replace it. The more the hypotheses, the shorter the time span of the truth. And what seems to be causing the number of hypotheses to grow in recent decades seems to be nothing other than scientific method itself. The more you look, the more you see. Instead of selecting one truth from a multitude, you are increasing the multitude. What this means, logically, is that as you try to move toward unchanging truth through, I add emphasis, through the application of scientific method, you actually do not move toward it at all. You move away from it. It is your application of scientific method that is causing it to change. Based on that passage, it is not clear to me whether or not Robert Persig himself views Aristotle's grid, and granted, I'm hard substituting the scientific method with Aristotle's grid because, as we were discussing earlier, without Aristotle's grid, there is no scientific method. It is not clear to me, based on that passage, that Robert Persig himself views Aristotle's grid to be normatively neutral. Can we depart from Robert Persig in terms of how we ought to define Aristotle's grid to be normatively neutral or have a normative value? Certainly. But on the basis of this passage alone, Aristotle's grid has a pretty damning characteristic about it. The last three sentences of that passage particularly stick out like a sore thumb to me. But that's not to say that the grid has something damning about it by definition, other than to say that it can be damning sometimes. So this is still a lot of the same material that we've been going over, which is it's possible for the scientific method to be damning. To itself. Right, it's possible. Oftentimes it's not. Oftentimes it's completely appropriate where you have a difficult problem to solve and you keep a lab notebook. As he was describing in the section about dealing right. with the motorcycle. That's what I'm referring to. The scientific method has a place. It's necessary. But it's erroneous to consider it sufficient. You can't say that there's only the scientific method. When I look at that passage, there are some very interesting things there in terms of allowing for a category of applications, a category of things distinguished from the scientific method or a category of things that the scientific method actually inhibits rather than enhances. And it doesn't seem to me that Persig is going after the scientific method at all. He's going after the people who state that no alternative to the scientific method exists. I also find that passage to be quite a unique one and very curious to consider in the sense of hypotheses growing in number rather than shrinking, which is supposed to be antithetical to the hypothesis of the scientific method itself, using the scientific method as the form of experimentation to say that the scientific method should be able to narrow these things down when it actually doesn't. Sometimes it does, and sometimes it doesn't. And what we seem to be doing is we're identifying and acknowledging sometimes the scientific method does not work by going out of our way with a term to point out situations where it does. Otherwise, there's no point in going out of your way to acknowledge when it does work. The normative part of that is to say that necessary but not sufficient must be included in the definition. And maybe that's all that's required. To say that it must be distinguished from X, that might just be the same as having a definition at all. So 
it seems to me that what you're pointing out is two opposing situations. A situation in which the scientific method is appropriately used and a situation in which the scientific method is inappropriately used. Okay. And so the question then insofar as what we're trying to do for building out a toolkit seems to be revolving around whether or not we can take the term Aristotle's grid and lock it into the situation in which the scientific method is appropriately used. And then to use your terminology, the situation in which the scientific methods are inappropriately used, that needs its own name. Do I understand you sufficiently accurately? I believe so. That would be consistent with saying Aristotle's grid as opposed to what, which means that there's a procedure when placing something into Aristotle's grid to ask first and foremost, does it belong in the grid? And then if it does, then put it there. And then if it doesn't, then don't put it in the grid. So that which does not belong in the grid, the pejorative version of Aristotle's grid? Would be what? I don't think we have a placeholder term for this. We just would refer to trying to put something in the grid that doesn't belong in the grid. What that means then is we're dealing with a situation in which the thing that has the normative value is not the grid itself, but rather the thing that is placed in the grid. The grid is just the grid. It's just a thing. It's like a rifle. It's an inanimate object that's just there. The normative value behind how the tool is used is completely dependent on its actual use. It's not inherent in the thing itself. That's, I think, the reason why I'm squirrely about hard locking in the term Aristotle's grid specifically to the situations in which the scientific method is appropriately used. Like I said before, we can take the normative part out of the definition if that's all that you need for the grid itself. There is a level of appropriateness that comes with the grid as we use the term. Because whenever we talk about something that we place into Aristotle's grid, we're saying that it's in the grid and it's appropriately in the grid. So you can say that the information is what has the normative value. That's fine. What ought to go into the spreadsheet? That's fine. Mm -hmm. The spreadsheet's just a spreadsheet. The spreadsheet doesn't care. The question of what ought to go into the spreadsheet is a separate question. So then there's a division between that which ought to be in the spreadsheet and that which ought not be in the spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. Which is what I was getting at earlier when I was talking about leaving the definition purely descriptive and then having the normative question, the normative commentary on whether or not it's being appropriately or inappropriately used being a separate independent question. But there isn't really a blank grid. It always has something in it. We can apply that to the information that's placed in the grid. I don't see a problem with that. So is this to say that there are three things? There is the infrastructure, the appropriate information in the infrastructure, and the inappropriate information in the infrastructure? I was just about to go there. I just had an idea. We might be able to get around this by coming up with a couple of different auxiliary terms. And this just came to me right now, so I haven't cross-vetted this. I'm on the front of Persic's train right now. So the grid is just the organizational infrastructure by itself. The follow-up question becomes, does the given information under examination belong in the grid? If it does, then Aristotle's grid becomes Aristotle's map. If it does not belong in the grid, then Aristotle's grid becomes Aristotle's snare. Part of the question here as well is, What's the point of referring to the inappropriate information? I think one of the reasons why we have historically used Aristotle's grid to refer specifically to information within the infrastructure that is appropriately there is basically to acknowledge the functioning infrastructure. We haven't used this term in order to identify something that shouldn't be there. We haven't? Why would you use this term other than to say this information is now in Aristotle's grid? And if you say this information is now in Aristotle's grid, it's appropriate for it to be there, because otherwise you wouldn't be saying so. Again, acknowledging the use of the term is acting as a means to acknowledge the fact that it's not given that all things in the grid are appropriately there. 
So here's something that is supposed to be there. It's fine to say that there's infrastructure with appropriate information, that it's possible that information is forced into the grid when it shouldn't be there, but I'm not sure when we would ever say or have a use for Aristotle's snare. Like you said yourself, we don't have a placeholder term for that because there's no context for it. I'm going to disagree. When would you ever say Aristotle's snare? In the previous episode, we were talking about the allegory of the shaman. We were talking about the passage from C.S. Lewis's Till We Have Faces of the dialogue between the fox and the priest and sort of his iconic line of much Greek wisdom. We have heard this day. There was one time that I'm thinking of as a thumb down example where we were having a discussion about a couple of the terms that were becoming emergent out of a couple of your own personal projects. And you were sort of sharing with me the writing and the work that you'd been doing for that particular day and how squirrely the meta was becoming of how you were trying to dig further and further down. And then I used the term event horizon. One of the things that I remember very clearly in that conversation that we had was I was urging caution to you. The phrase that I used at the time was going beyond the event horizon, which is functionally to say that you would be trying to put terms into Aristotle's grid that should not be there. I was urging caution because there is a threshold that you need to be careful about not crossing. And in that particular context, in that particular conversation, I remember using the term, quote unquote, Aristotle's grid with a negative normative value. It's going to help you up into a point, but if you try to extend it beyond the event horizon, beyond the threshold of appropriateness, it's going to be really, really problematic. Granted, the majority of the times that we do use the term Aristotle's grid, we are using it in the context in which it is appropriate for information to go into the grid. But in order to answer the question you just asked, that is one thumb down example that I clearly remember using the term Aristotle's grid in the opposite sense. Now, maybe that needs to be changed to Aristotle's snare. I don't think we can get away with leaving the inappropriate use of the grid as simply unacknowledged. You can't equate Aristotle's snare with the event horizon itself. Correct. Because there are less catastrophic examples of the error, arguably. Another way to phrase this is to ask, do we need to acknowledge that Aristotle's grid can have a normative attachment at all within the term Aristotle's grid? Because as we are looking at this with a little bit more scrutiny, it's less and less clear as to whether or not we're trying to legitimately attach any kind of normative descriptions. Aristotle's grid itself would prefer not to have any normative descriptions attached to it, but the grid being the inanimate grid, if you allow the grid to be an inanimate grid, then you run into the problem of inappropriate information in the grid, which the grid also has no way to distinguish. The knife just needs to come down in the right place. So this is actually a decent segue into this question that I've been holding on to because this question seems to be pointing directly at the same problem. And essentially, what I'm looking at is a question which says, true or false, one map can be better than another map. It depends on the way that you're analyzing it, because the map is either accurate or not accurate. Assuming that the maps are accurate, they might even be the same, they might align. How are you distinguishing the two maps? From a purely grid perspective, no. All maps align, the maps aren't better, they're just accurate. But depending on the information that you're trying to harvest, and the lens through which you're extracting the usefulness of that information, the efficiency of that information, how to navigate the map, or how to navigate so that you find what you need, one map might have what you need and another map might not. One might have what you need more efficiently, depending on what you need. In which case, a quality map 
is better than an accurate but haphazardly thrown together map that's difficult to read. Or a map that lacks the information that you require. You need a road map and you're looking at a very high quality topography map. The threshold of function changes depending on the information that you're trying to access. Mm -hmm. And the information that you need access to is extremely circumstantial, which is why it's so important for it to be properly organized. There seems to me to be some kind of a difference between an accurate map and a good map, a quality map versus an accurate map. Well, all quality maps are accurate, but it's still a question as to whether or not all accurate maps are quality. I think that's the only real point of possible contention, because I don't think you can say that a map is quality and have it be inaccurate. Fine. I'm granting accuracy across the board, because obviously an accurate map is better than an inaccurate map, because an inaccurate map is worthless, and an accurate map at least has the possibility of being worth anything. So that's not what I'm identifying. The accuracy of a map is necessary, but not sufficient. Mm -hmm like Aristotle's grid, is necessary but not sufficient as an organizational structure, referring to the infrastructure, the grid itself. If you're just talking about accuracy, now we're talking about quality versus not quality mechanics in terms of a machine, a mechanism. If we are just talking about accuracy, if we go beyond the mere discussion of accuracy, we have to go beyond the mere discussion of accuracy before we can start discussing the question of quality versus non-quality mechanics, right? It seems to me to be the case that there's more to acknowledging the quality of a mechanism than the frequency at which it's accurate. How does that help us determine whether or not we ought to include the normative aspect in the definition of Aristotle's grid? The controversy is around whether Aristotle's grid needs to be accounting for quality or not. The accuracy of the grid is its function. My intuition is telling me that it does not. And I point to the section in the Persig where he's talking about the juggernaut. And I point to the commentary that arises from that passage about the power of Aristotle's grid stemming from its ability to root out internal inconsistencies. And even in the Persig itself, when it's talking about the dialectic, that section where he's talking about such a philosopher was not long in coming. When he's talking in the earlier portion of the book about the motorcycle manual and how the writing is more boring than ditch water. My intuition tells me that the definition of the term Aristotle's grid doesn't have to be concerned with quality. It only has to be concerned with accuracy. Whether or not it's used in a manner that is consistent with quality is a follow-up question. But that's just to restate the definition as functionally a Persig claim, where Aristotle's grid is a necessary but not sufficient organizational system, subdivides and categorizes relevant information, must be distinguished from quality, where x equals quality. x equals quality. You have to consider quality separately, and if you don't consider quality at all, then bad. Bad quality, because you don't consider quality, so you're not going to have it. Which then fits nicely into my earlier improvised recommendation of further distinguishing between map and snare. I don't see a problem with that immediately. Don't put quality into the grid because quality comes before the grid. Yeah. And the reason why I like that is because that's also consistent with what's in the novel. Well, that's a major thesis of the novel. Right. So I think that formulation is very consistent with that thesis. Which then means that, how about this? Aristotle's grid is an organizational system that seeks to subdivide and or categorize all relevant information that results in strict internal consistency. And then we put an asterisk on it. Asterisk. Only insert quality into grid. Asterisk. Whether or not Aristotle's grid is used in a way that's consistent with quality is a separate but necessary question. That gives you the internal consistency of rooting out contradictions. Mm-hmm which is also a reference to the lab notebook. Which is a reference to the juggernaut. But it also accounts for all true maps must align. Correct. And the power of being able to understand that 
that which is true doesn't contradict other things that are true. Mm -hmm. Which is not something that you just sweep under the rug. The monkey can't get around that. The character that is the monkey would like to get around that. Which indicates that the grid does have value as a juggernaut and as an organizational system. And a necessary organizational system. But just having this organizational system doesn't mean that you also have the equivalent of reality itself. Because you don't. That seems a lot cleaner to me. It's a map location of information after it becomes subdivided. There's work to properly subdividing things. The conclusions of those subdivisions get placed into the grid. They get cross-examined by other things in the grid, which allows them to stay in the grid. More things are subcategorized, and more relevant information is added to the grid and continues to be cross-examined. And then that information is available when needed, assuming that the organizational system is functioning properly, which allows you to find the information that you need when you need it. It's not sufficient, it's not equivalent to reality, because the question of quality, the question of whether the grid is used with quality, is a separate but necessary question. That would be the asterisk. Which means the grid is not all organizational systems as a result of subdivision, because Aristotle's grid is becoming a sub-node as an organizational system under a greater organizational system that contains Aristotle's grid plus the considerations of quality. Which is consistent with page 317 in Persig's own book. The self-referential coherency of this is very difficult to manage. I want to try something. Hopefully it doesn't break everything. All right. So this would indicate that it's possible for someone to operate entirely in Aristotle's grid as an organizational system, but that they shouldn't because operating entirely in that grid is going to be a separation from the logos. Which is really the same question as to whether or not the grid needs to be concerned with quality is to say whether the grid needs to be concerned with the logos. Look at the asterisk and just replace the word quality with the word logos. Whether or not Aristotle's grid is used in a way that's consistent with the logos is a separate but necessary question. Which is simply to say that it is possible to use Aristotle's grid in such a way that is disconnected from the logos. Which seems fine to me. It is possible. Whether you use them together is a separate but necessary question. Correct. It is entirely possible to abuse Aristotle's grid. You shouldn't do that. The way that you know that you shouldn't do that is to consult the Logos, mm -hmm. which is outside of the grid. Correct. Even though it can influence and work with the grid and dictate things that go into the grid. Right. Which is really just to say that not only can the Logos and Aristotle's grid work in tandem, they ought to work in tandem. But you can't put the Logos into the grid because then the Logos has nothing to actually offer to you anymore. Correct. Because you understand everything that the Logos could possibly tell you, mm -hmm. which is wrong for a lot of reasons. And might I say that this formulation is also coincidentally very consistent with a lot of Buddhist teachings. This book is called Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Manual. Zen is this particular form of Buddhism as it grew and existed in Japan, but the forerunners of Zen as it existed in China had a very nice formulation where it said that the experiential meditative aspects of the Buddhist teachings and the intellectual philosophical aspects of the Buddhist teachings were, as they said, two wings of the same bird. A bird can't fly with one wing. You need both. You can't say that these are the same thing. But you do need both. They should be operating in tandem. You can't collapse the Logos into Aristotle's grid. But just because these are two separate things does not mean that they ought to have nothing to do with each other. They ought to come together and function together in tandem, even though that they are separate things. Basically, the organizational system, which seeks to subdivide and categorize all relevant information. Resulting in strict internal consistency. Resulting in a strict internal consistency, which must be distinguished from the logos, but can work very well with the logos. They're not the same. But using the Logos to acquire the best information to proceed allows for that information, especially when that information is internally strict, as the best information would be to get placed into the grid. So it's a repository for the best information that cross-examines itself.
Well, these two things cross-examine each other, and in cross-examining each other, they reinforce each other. Well, the information cross-examines other information in the grid, and that creates a situation where the information was or wasn't actually the best information at hand. Mm -hmm. But the source of the best information is not from that which is already in the grid, because the best information is the information that needs to be added to the grid because it's not there yet. Does that account for all of the nodes that need to be accounted for? Yeah. I don't see any holes with that. Using the logos to access the best information allows for that best information to be best organized into the best system available. It is the best. Sounds internally consistent to me. Is that to say that despite the increasing multitude of hypotheses that this problem can be a problem, but is not inherently a problem insofar as the question of which is the best hypothesis to pursue next is always being asked? Well, yeah, because that's the question that quality answers, to use Persig's terminology, and also to transfer it over into our terminology, that's the question that the Logos answers. I have this increasing multitude of hypotheses. Which one do I pursue? What do I do next? What's the not, best one? What's the best one? The grid doesn't tell you that. Mm -hmm. Quality tells you that. The Logos tells you that. So long as you're plugged into that, then no harm, no foul. But if the grid is the only thing that you have, you are up a creek without a paddle. Mm -hmm. I would just be continuing to cross-examine these terms that we already have. So if that's sufficient for what you set out to account for, then great. So by way of summary, the Persic knife inevitably gives rise to Aristotle's grid which is an organizational system that seeks to subdivide and or categorize all relevant information resulting in strict internal consistency. Asterisk, whether Aristotle's grid is used in a way that's consistent with the logos slash quality is a separate but necessary question. Quality is Persig's term. Quality would be Persig's term, Logos would be the term that we've already established in this podcast. Anything you'd like to add? Do we need to return to how to distinguish between the Western and non-Western? Or is Not that today. separated from this term now? That can be separated from this term. We got this. Because this term with this definition will have a very nice, what's the volleyball term? Set to go there, but that'll be a separate process. I do think that returning to that would be worthwhile, but not here. Fair enough. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been The Garot. So, until next time, Vido Rigo Sperante. Keep breathing, everyone.